this video, I'm going to give an overview discussion of enterprise integration patterns. First of all, what is integration? What can be different systems working together? I think about a time when I booked a trip on a travel website and I put in my frequent flyer number and then immediately when I purchased the trip, I could go over to the airline, put in my frequent flyer number and it recognized who I was. It saw that I had a flight reserved and allowed me to change my seat based on my frequent flyer status. So in this case, we have not only two different systems, but actually two different companies working together. We can also have different programming languages. Think about legacy systems or systems that have been around for a long time and a company or an organization has invested a lot of money into it and it's proven itself over the test of time. We don't always want to rip things down and replace them just because the programming language might be a bit older. A better idea might be to leverage all of the assets that we've invested in and the hardening that's occurred over time, and then simply integrate with newer technologies where needed. We can also have different message formats. Could be flat file, XML, JSON, anything else. But today, integration is really expected. If we roll back 20 years or so ago, I recall a time when you would deposit a check in a bank or maybe even go to a bank branch, and they couldn't tell you your balance. You'd find that out the next day after everything settled. Well, imagine having that experience today where you deposit $100 in cash and they can't give you a confirmation that it's actually been deposited until the next day. So as IT's life cycle has shortened, so have our expectations. Uh, another view I remember of this is something I remember from one of my first jobs back in the 90s when I supported two different departments in a Fortune 500 corporation. One was the employee relocation department, and the other was HR. Both had the same database, theoretically. But the way they kept them in sync is that HR would get notification of an employee relocating. Someone in HR would type the record into their database. Then they'd print that out, send that via interoffice mail to relocations. Relocations would open up the interoffice mail and type it into their database. So you see that kind of synchronization is, number one, not timely, and number two, error prone, which is why we want a universal, of, universal view of data, or in other words, one source of the truth. Now, why do we have integration patterns? And a lot of this I spoke about earlier, but we have different ways that we can communicate, and we might also have different message formats over time. That can get tricky. Think of this example. Maybe you've written an app that runs on iPhone or Android and you've written a back-end service. Well, eventually you realize you want to add a new feature which requires changing the way the messages look going from your back-end service down to those mobile devices. Now this gets really tricky because you don't own those mobile devices, so they might upgrade to the new message format over time and you're in a position where you have to handle both formats simultaneously. That's where routing and modification can come in handy. You can receive an old version of a message and then enhance it to make it look like a new version and then send it on through. Or receive an old version of a message, look at it, and realize that it has to be processed by an older process instead of a newer process. So one other thought with integration patterns is point-to-point -point versus hub and spoke. Before we really mastered integration as a science, we would typically write what we call bespoke connections from one piece of software to another. In other words, a direct connection from one piece of software to another. This worked in the early days when we were not connecting a whole lot of things together. But now we're in a point where we're connecting a lot of things together and we might have software that wants to be connected to us some of the time, but not all of the time. So this is where hub and spoke works a bit better. It's a bit easier to visualize this with a graphic, so let's think about what point-to-point -point would be. You see, I have eight systems here that all need to talk to each other, so I have to draw a line between each of these systems, and it's not even counting some of the connections, like from this guy to this guy, so on and so forth. Inefficient because what happens if I add another piece of software? Well, there are eight items here, so I have to draw eight different lines. That's point-to-point. -point. Let's consider topics and subscriptions. This is a bit more efficient because you'll essentially have a producer, and the producer will put a message on a topic and say, well, anyone who wants to subscribe, feel free to listen to this. 
and then the producer is detached from the person who is receiving the message, which means that different people can subscribe at different times. Or by people, I mean different pieces of software, but different organizations, different companies, different people, different software can come in and subscribe to this topic and unsubscribe as needed, and they're only listening to these messages while they're subscribed. An example that I use oftentimes is a microservice to collect plant information or specimen information. So consider a plant the scientific definition of a plant, genus, species, cultivar, and common name. Consider a specimen to be a specific plant that you plant in your yard. So if we put this together as a series of microservices, what we'll have is a plant diary microservice, which is registering these specimens. And it's relying on another microservice, which is already built and already in public, the plant places plant data microservice. So the plant data microservice is the scientific definition of a plant, where the plant diary is talking about specimens. But one of the things we're going to do when we catalog our specimens is we might upload photos, and photos can be a very heavy process. So we can... Uh, upload the photos, and then offline we can have a separate process which resizes the photos and watermarks the photos. These can communicate to each other via a topic called photo in. So when a photo comes on this microservice, it goes on the photo in topic, and then the photo processor reads it, it processes the photo, and if all went well, it will put a confirmation that the photo was processed on the photo out topic. If something went wrong, it will go on to the photo exception topic. Finally, we have a third microservice, which is listening, and only listening, not writing, to each of the, these three topics, and it uses this information to determine what has been processed. If I see something in photo in, and I see it in photo out, that means successful process. If I see something in photo in but nowhere else, it means it's something that we're waiting to process. If I see something in photo exception, it means that something went wrong. This process could be implemented in one of many different programming languages, but I'll show you an example that I have. So in this program, I'm going to upload a picture of a swamp white oak. And I'll show you the original. I just grabbed it off the internet from Plant Places. Just one moment. Uh, I'll show you the original, and you can see that there's no watermarking, and it's a fairly good-sized image. So our success criteria here is I'm going to upload this through the plant diary or the specimens microservice. Then the photo processor will watermark it and resize it. And then we will see that it has been processed in our dashboard, which is yet another microservice. So just take a look at this. Remember the current state of our dashboard. And now I'm going to hit submit. I hit submit, I come back to the dashboard, I hit refresh, and if you take a look, you can see that the swamp white oak has been processed because this simple dashboard is listening to three cues, or topics rather, and this simple user interface is submitting the photo metadata to one of those cues so that the resizer can process it and then the dashboard can report on it. Now let's check on our success criteria. If I take a look over here at photos, I can go to thumbnail and I see our swamp white oak and you can see it's, it's been resized. And if I zoom up a bit, you can, you can see a little hint of a watermark uh, down on the right. There we go. So three microservices working together in the heavy lifting one, the one that processed this photo. Because it is an independent microservice, it's also independently scalable. So we could put this somewhere in the cloud, and if we have a big event, maybe it's spring planting time, or maybe some kind of festivals going on and people are buying plants, then this photo processor can scale up while the plant diary and the dashboard are holding a much smaller load. Let's go through a bit of the enterprise integration vernacular. First of all, microservices. Do one thing and do it well. That's the theme for microservices. We want to think about one little thing it's going to do and write one piece of software around it and then connect them together, connect together all these microservices with our enterprise integration. And that's what I call metaprogramming. When you have a bunch of microservices, you can assemble them together like the way we make chili in Cincinnati. You take the pasta, the chili, the beans, the onions, and the cheese, whatever the customer orders, and all of it is already cooked. 
but when the customer comes to place an order, you do that final assembly and give the customer the three-way, four-way, five-way chili, spaghetti, beans, onions, whatever that customer ordered. Similar thing with microservice. Think of the pasta, the ground beef, the cheese, the beans, the onions. Think of each of those as a microservice that we can put together. Message. That's how we send data from one service to another. Transformation. This is a really neat one, and Apache Camel does a good job with this. We can write some rules in XML, and if needed, we can have them call out to Java classes that will transform a message when in route. This is similar to the example I gave earlier, where you might have multiple consumers who have your software on their phone, and if you upgrade that software, not all consumers will have it at once, so you might have to deal with different message formats. And one way to do that would be take the old message format and transform it so it looks like the new message format. So to your server, all of the messages look homogenous. Pipes and filters. Pipe is like a connection from one node to another, if you will, from one microservice to another or from one filter to another. So a pipe is that connection, and the filter is something it's doing to determine which messages to send to the next step. Maybe we have duplicate messages and we want to reduce that to one unique message for each message. Maybe we need to add some other value like add a timestamp to it or some security or something like that. That's what the filters will do. Message router is a similar concept and it's another way to solve the problem I mentioned earlier where you have your app on multiple phones and then you upgrade your app and you're getting different versions of the messages. One way, the transformation way, is to make all the messages look the same. The other option is to use a message router. It might look at the content of these messages that are coming up from the mobile device, whatever form they are, maybe some type of data, some type of who knows what. It can look at those, determine what's old version and what's new version, and then it can route the old version to the old server and the new version to the new server. Several things we can do there. Point to point we talked about, that's typically a queue. A queue is typically first in, first out. You put a message on the queue, someone consumes the message off the queue, the message is no longer on the queue. That's what we'll call a point to point connection. Where publish subscribe is a little bit different and that uses a topic. So with publish subscribe, you put the message out there and it can get picked up by multiple subscribers. Maybe you have several agents running with one subscriber and then you can associate it with something that's called a group ID. So in other words, you put a message on a topic and it gets read once by every subscriber who has a unique group ID. Routing, uh, that really sums up everything we just talked about. The ability to filter things, split things, put them together, take them apart, and route them to different, uh, different destinations. Now, sources and destinations, when we talk about where we're getting messages and where we're putting messages, a lot of times we think we're going from one microservice to another. But we can broaden this definition a bit, and we can think of other sources and destinations of messages. First of all, cues and topics, which we've talked through a bit. Secondly, a file system. This is common for things like mainframes, where many times programs talk to each other by writing something like a flat file. We could also have web services, which uh, we don't hear about now as much as we used to. Email, that's a big one. Imagine where you have a route where something reads a message off a topic and then sends you an email. This is really handy if that message on a topic is something like a new user signed up and you want to go maybe double check that user or give that user elevated privileges or something like that. Or maybe it's our photo processor service and if we have photos that are open to the public, we might want some manual intervention in there to make sure that nobody's posting anything inappropriate. So you could have a message go from a topic to an email to let you know that there's a new photo to look at. Database Hibernate, all of these things can be sources and destinations. And these days we're thinking about reactive programming, live data. So it's interesting that a lot of these components have now grown up and matured to the point where they can play in this role of live data. Now, a queue to queue camel route. This is a route where uh, you can have a message and you can enhance it, you can filter it, you can route it, so on and so forth. What do we need for a queue to queue camel route? Uh, a, some type of web project, and usually in an IDE, we'll need Maven for dependencies. We will need to configure Spring to tell it about this route. 
And then camel config XML is an important file because that's an XML file where we can set up a route from one source to one destination, so on and so forth. Another option and one that's a bit more common these days, and this is what I used on the microservice example that I gave you before, is Apache Kafka. Apache Kafka is an event streaming platform. So I want to listen to an event like picture has been uploaded, picture has been watermarked, picture has been resized. I want to do something when that event occurs. Or on the other hand, maybe I've just done something and I want to let the world know about it and whoever wants to pick it up can run with it. A big example of this in real life is transaction processing. Think about when you're in the store and you have a transaction, you put your credit card in, and then it asks you if you want an e-receipt. After you, after you finish that transaction, this transaction needs to go to your credit card processor, it needs to go to the retailer for accounting, and then it needs to go to the e-receipt service provider, and many, many others. That's a real-life example of publish subscribe that you likely interact with almost every day and maybe never thought about it that way. One big thing about Kafka is that it is meant for very high volume, or it's built for that at least. So scalable, fault tolerant, and high availability. Those kind of sound like marketing buzzwords to one degree, uh, but to another degree, what that really means is that the information that you have on the topic is persistent. So if a computer loses power, it will still be there when the computer powers back on again. And also there's redundancy. So if we completely lose the hard drive on one computer, we can go to another. So a Kafka instance can actually live on multiple computers where the earlier instances of queues and the like, we would tend to have one dedicated computer for them. So this opens up a whole lot of opportunity with Kafka. So this has been an overview look at enterprise integration patterns. As always, I hope this video was helpful and I look forward to reading your comments. Thank you.